31. But 31 questions can take a long time, so. But if we do well and get through all of this, then tomorrow will be a nice day. And I'm game for that. Look at that. Maybe we're going to do great. Uh oh. Common misunderstanding point. What does a high viscosity index mean? This was not understood well, clearly. Because the first one, everybody got right. What is, it does not change with temperature. Right. So if I want a certain viscosity for my engine, why would I want that to change? What is lightning mode? Hmm. Well, if everybody gets it right, I move on quick. If people get it wrong, I use that feedback to say this is something that, that wasn't understood. So I don't really like rushing these because I know it moves faster, but then I think people learn less. I mean, does, but it's your class. If you folks want to do lightning mode, I can just blast through it. Um, if you log in, then you get the review time. So do you guys want to go fast? I'll blast through them. All right, we're getting a pretty solid lead on the no. Please teach me what I don't know, which I love to see. It's actually good. I like that. Okay, so low viscosity index would be something like honey that changes a lot with temperature. And if I do that, if I use something like that, uh, there's a rare instance where we want a low viscosity index. But you think about our, our airplane in Alberta. We don't want to get stuck in Alberta because our oil got too thick when it was cold. We want oil to be always oily, we want to always flow. Like the expansion in the engine, if we could have engine metals that didn't expand much, that would make a better engine, wouldn't it? Okay, so what this is saying, it weighs, 80% as much as water. I'm eating a nectarine. It's kind of crunchy. So it'll float in water. It would actually sink in air too. Right. The viscosity, yeah, nothing else. The small peaches, uh, no, a nectarine is a peach with no fuzz. They're the smooth peaches. I guess just coming into season in California, I really like the Okanagan peaches. If you get the chance this summer, go to the Okanagan and go to uh, Karameas and go to the fruit stands there and get some fresh peaches from Karameas. They're probably the best peaches in the world. 
or the cherries out yeah oh okay so where you can go what is, Sheila what's the name of that farm I'll get you the name there's a local um there's a local place uh starts with a v um in Ladner that brings in like truckloads of fruit from the Okanagan and they're really good or just go on the weekend yeah yeah it's worth it especially if you're if you're visiting Canada never been here before and you're you're here's you you need to go to the Okanagan and get some of our fresh cherries and peaches and oh my gosh I make myself sick on blueberries every year they're going to come into season soon Mm. See, the best way to eat cherries, in my opinion, is on a hot day in the summer with a big bag of cherries sitting in the middle of the car and the passenger side window open and spitting the pits out as you drive along with the windows open. That's, that is a beautiful day. Well, no, that's why I said the passenger side. Yeah, no, not in our cars. That's not nice. Not of the bikers either. I ride my motorbike. I don't want that. But you know, thanks to that Nathan. All right, I'll remember that. Okay. Um, so yes, ashless dispersant. The W in front tells me that it's an ashless dispersant. The Aeroshell One Hundred is like a break-in oil. um okay so uh brayden you're asking why the other ones weren't ashless um d uh, dispersant okay aeroshell one 100 has got no w the spirax adw90 this is a gear oil it might be a detergent oil but you don't know the chevron 15w40 well it probably is but you don't know, right? Um, I'm trying to just kick, kick to this one. I think there were slightly different oils in that question. Um, because the W is in front, that's an ashless dispersion oil. All the other ones are a question mark. Um, okay, so which of these has the highest viscosity? Okay, Aeroshell 100. If I were to convert that to SAE, what rating is Aeroshell 100 in SAE? 50 okay so 50 this is an sae rating with a w in the middle you know that so it's a 40. this is also sae because that's just too low of a number and this adw90 is an sae rating so this would be like 180 in the and the aviation okay so a lot of people missing this one the ADW90, because this is SAE, and you can tell with a W in the middle, is going to be thicker than the Aeroshell 100. All right, let's move along. Oh, I didn't talk about this very much. So this is another good thing about these cahoots. They catch me on things that I forgot to talk about. I mean, I mentioned it, but only in passing. So most of you will miss this.
Yeah, okay. So right after engine change or engine overhaul or cylinder change, we're breaking in the engine. And that is the only time we use a non-ashless dispersant oil. We use the cheapest, crappiest oil there is basically right after a cylinder change or engine overhaul. Because remember I drew that little picture of wanting to shave the peaks off of the honing in the cylinder. Remember that one? You got the, all those little mountain peaks and we want to break in the engine and knock the tops off of those peaks. That is the only time we use a non-ashless dispersant oil. And it's actually not got anything to do with, with the ashless dispersant. It's got to do with the anti-scuff additives that will also be missing. When they make a quality oil with scuff additives and detergents, um, it's nice and slippery. It does a great job, but the engine won't seat the rings properly. So after the engine has been broken in, we use our quality oils. When the engine is brand new, or we've just changed a cylinder, we actually use a pretty cheap oil. Um, what do we normally use in turbine engines? What kind of oil normally goes in turbine engines? Synthetic, yes. Um, and during cold weather to reduce sludge buildup, what do we typically do in cold? What do we change about the oil in cold weather as opposed to warm weather? What do we change about the oil for cold weather operations? Multi-grade and or a slightly thinner oil. In the summer, we'll run a 40 weight oil, like an airplane in the summer, you'd run a 50 weight oil. And in the winter, you might run a 40 or a 10W40. So we change the viscosity with the weather a little bit. Now, bearing in mind that this is an airplane course, so we're talking about airplane engines, not car engines. Right, gas turbine engines use synthetic oil. Piston engines rarely do. And after cylinder change or engine overhaul would be the worst time to use a synthetic oil. If you were going to use a synthetic oil, that's when you would not use it. Don't need to know this for th Thursday, but you know, for life. Okay, I'm going to lightning round this one. Three, two, one. Nice. Almost everybody got it wrong. Quebec. Quebec is not bilingual. Quebec is French. That's why they keep wanting to leave. Yeah, Quebec doesn't even want to be part of Canada. Yeah. Pardonnez-moi. Yes. If they weren't in the middle, we would have let them leave. Yeah, we'd have a hole between the east and the west. But other than that, I'm pretty sure we would have left them leave. Okay, uh, fuel dilution. Okay, so fuel dilution does not speed up the oil warm up. Fuel dilution is to help us get the darn thing started on a cold morning. That hopper tank, which is built into the main tank uh, on these radial engines, uh, helps speed up the oil warm up. And what it does is it allows us to not warm up all of the oil we can just warm up some of the oil. We should forcibly integrate them into our culture. 
Yeah, that's a good idea. We've tried that a few times and it always ends well, doesn't it? France doesn't want them because they're not uh, Parisian French anymore. They've developed their own culture. Yeah, it's mutual. Kind of makes sense though. The French people who really liked France probably weren't the ones that came over to Quebec. America did it seriously. They actually had a, you know, war against the British and they really didn't like England. Right, oil tank vented through the crankcase. That might be good to know. That might be good to know. Ooh, that's probably tempting, but I can't speak professional sports, so I have no idea if Tyler Toffoli is a good guy or not. Right, consistent viscosity. They don't they don't nail it, but they do a much better job than standard oils. No, expansion tank. Expansion space in the oil tank. seem to be saying this a lot might be a hint right and people aren't getting it so I don't know what else to say might be worth noting how are we doing folks we've got still 16 or 17 questions left to go that's going to take us at least a half an hour um, do we want to keep going or do we want to finish this tomorrow? Keep going. Yes or no? Whoops. Let's get to go. Keep going. Keep going. Yes or no? Oh, good. We've got lots of energy here. This has been solid. Let's keep going. All right. It's hard from my side of the computer screen with a bunch of blank and quiet to know where people's energy level is sometimes. So. Okay, there we go. Propeller feathering. 
Uh, what do we do about water or sludge? What do we do with the water or sludge in the oil? Come on, folks, what do we do about it? Filter it out. Right, water boils off and any sludge gets filtered out. So it's actually a bad thing to leave those little settling points. You want to keep it churned up. back pressure for the scavenge pump. I'm not sure why people would choose that. We don't really care about back pressure on a pump. We have an open hose. We want to provide positive flow to the pressure pump. Remember I talked about pumps pushing better than they pull. And if we've got, if the, if the oil tank was located low on the engine, it'd be real easy for us to service. But the oil pump would have to pull it uphill. You imagine what that would do on a cold day when the oil is cold and thick and doesn't want to flow at all and that oil pump is trying to pump it uphill, it would just it would just cavitate. It wouldn't actually pump any oil. Whereas if we put it high, gravity is always kind of forcing oil into the pump. So I'm not sure why folks are misunderstanding this. Does somebody want to explain why they picked red? Was that just a misclick for speed or? That was really popular. Like. If this were on the test, I'm seeing that half of you got it wrong, and that's always a, a warning sign for me. Is anybody still there? Yes. All right, people are there. Okay, no answer. Off I go. Okay, this was messed up. Everyone has left the chat. Okay, what went on here? Which pump has the higher flow rate? The scavenge pump. What happens if you put a bigger pressure pump than scavenge pump? You'll, you'll end up flooding your engine with oil. You will not have a dry sump, right? The high, pressure pump has higher pressure. But this doesn't ask the pressure. This asks the flow rate. Flow rate would be measured in gallons per minute. And pressure would be measured in PSI. So the scavenge, no, they're, very, they're, they're not the same at all. Um, you develop pressure when you have flow and a restriction to the flow. What's the restriction to the flow for the 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 uh, scavenge pump? I mean, nothing, right? It's got an open hose going straight to an open tank with a big vent in the top. The restriction to flow for the pressure pump is all those tiny gaps in the bearings. And so we design a pump that will put out 60, 70 PSI. The scavenge pump will never see more than five psi. Um, it's like a fire hose versus a pressure washer. What is the average pressure of a fire hose? Would you suspect? Pretty high. I would say probably between fifty and eighty psi. 
maybe 100 psi we want some decent pressure to launch water all the way at the at the building and how many gallons per minute do you suppose a fire hose hose puts out hundreds of gallons per minute right now what about a pressure washer how much pressure does a pressure washer put out oh like 35 3000 psi they'll put out like two to three thousand psi and how many gallons per minute does your pressure washer hose it puts it's just this little tiny hose right so if i were to put a pressure washer into my swimming pool into my swimming pool and have the the, the fire hose the fire hose is one tenth of the pressure but if I put a pressure washer into the swimming pool and a fire hose out of the swimming pool, the fire hose has less pressure, but way more volume. And that's what we do with our pressure and our scavenge pumps. We build a pump and it's not as dramatic an example as that, but flow rate is volume. Yes. Is volume per minute. All right. Glad I stopped here because most people got it wrong. And I believe there's a question about this on the test because this is an important one to understand. The scavenge pump always has a higher flow rate. It must. Right, around the gears. Gear pump is a positive displacement pump. Uh, no, positive pressure. The reason it's not a positive pressure, remember I just said pressure is a result of two things, flow and a resistance to flow. How much pressure is in your garden hose if you just have it wide open on the end? Is there very much, very much pressure in that hose? Right. Now, what if you stick your thumb over the end? the pressure will grow inside the hose, right? So that's the thing with these gear pumps. If you had a gear pump pumping water through your hose, you would have almost no pressure if your thumb was not on the end of the hose. If you put your thumb on the end of the hose, you could get enough pressure to break the hose or break the pump, you know, unless it's got a relief valve because it's a positive displacement pump. Oh, look at this. I asked this very same question in the lecture. It's open when the engine is cold. We're bypassing the cooler, right? If you want the, oh, pardon me, uh, when the engine is cold, why is the oil pressure relief valve open when the, uh, is the oil thicker or thinner when the engine is cold? Thicker. So it will develop more pressure. And more pressure means that that valve will open a little bit farther, all things being equal RPM and whatnot.
Okay, see if you understand the oil pressure relief valve with respect to RPM. Oh, definitely not. Okay, when the engine is at low RPM, how much pressure does the oil pump make? Not much. So what will happen to the oil pressure relief valve? It will close. And when the engine RPM picks up, the pressure will build until we hit 55, 60 PSI, whatever our, our setting is. And at that point, the pressure is going to try and build higher, but the relief valve will open and bleed that pressure off. This was really poor response rate here. Um, what has not been understood here? Like only three of you got it right. So it seems like I didn't teach it well. And I don't want to move past this without a little better understanding of, because I mean, I know I'm going to get a terrible result on the test when you folks are asked whatever version of this question there is on the test. If, if three of you got it right and everybody else got it wrong, it's kind of a red flag for me. Do I need to go back to the picture here? Like, when the pressure increases, let me pull up, up a picture. So how does engine RPM directly affect the valve? Okay, let's go back to... Um, find the right picture. No, oh, one way to go. This one here, uh, slideshow. Okay. Take a look at this system here. Engine is spinning at, where's my pen? Let's imagine the engine is spinning at 1,000 RPM. And this pump will make 10 gallons per minute of flow. This restriction here is such that 10 gallons per minute is going to make 45 PSI. We got you with me? Because there's a restriction, I've got a certain viscosity oil. Okay, let's increase to 1500 RPM. What is my flow rate going to be? I've kept the math simple. It's not completely out of range here. So how much oil is this pump going to pump? How many gallons per minute? 15, yeah. Equals 15 gallons per minute. Okay. What will happen to my pressure? Because I've got the same size hole here. If I'm going to try and pump 15 gallons per minute through the same size hole, what will happen to my pressure? Okay. What kind of pressure do you think it'll hit? 70 PSI, maybe? Sound about right? Can we go from 45 PSI up to 70? Okay. I've got this pressure relief valve. This doesn't want to see 70, 70 PSI. At 60 PSI, it starts to open and leak you know, maybe three gallons per minute is recirculating back to the beginning. And so now instead of 15, this becomes 12 and we get 60 PSI oil pressure. Did that explanation make sense? I'm making up some numbers here, but they're not, they're not way out of range. Okay. So what happens if I increase to 2,500 RPM? How much pump is, how much oil is this gonna flow? 25 gallons per minute, right? What kind of pressure would I get? Probably 100 PSI. 
if I didn't have this valve, right? If I didn't have that valve, I'd probably have 100 PSI. But what's going to happen is this valve, instead of opening and pushing three gallons per minute, it's now going to pump, that, what was the difference there? It's probably going to let 12 gallons per minute go this way and leave me with 13 gallons per minute this way. Oops. And I'll end up with probably 65 PSI. Does that make sense? So the faster I turn the engine, the more flow I've got, the more this valve opens, because we've exceeded the, the flow needed to make 60 PSI. All right. Back to the Kahoot. Okay, so terrible result. Does this now make sense? Oil pressure relief is farther open when we're at high RPM because we've got to do something with all of that oil. All right, this is why I don't like doing lightning because stuff like this has just got to get covered. That's normal. Thank you. Okay, the oil analysis pro program, most good owners are running their air aircraft on an oil analysis program anyway. Um, I wouldn't necessarily start one or not start one because of that. So the oil filter bypass valve, it's in the name. It's going to bypass oil around the filter. Ooh. Do we want to prevent, well, I guess when it's closed, it prevents unfiltered oil from reaching the engine. But what happens if the filter clogs? Do we not want to allow unfiltered oil to reach, reach the engine? What would we get if we didn't allow uh, unfiltered oil to bypass the filter when it got clogged? What kind of oil would we get? No oil. Yeah, you wouldn't get dirty oil because the filter will not pass dirty oil. The filter will not allow any oil. Like, let's take a look back at that. Uh, that is the uh, oil thermostat. That's the oil cooler bypass or the oil thermostat. And it responds only to temperature. So we've got this slide here. This is out of a car. It doesn't have a, an oil filter bypass, but the oil filter bypass would go right here and would allow oil, if you've got more than you know 10 PSI differential across this filter, that filter is getting clogged and it would allow oil to skip the filter. That makes sense, Braden? And then my oil cooler, Oh, cooler. Here's my oil cooler. This is my oil cooler bypass valve, sometimes called the oil thermostat. The oil thermostat, in its name, thermo, uh, responds to temperature. And then the oil filter bypass, also in its name, uh, bypasses the dirty filter. So there's three valves, three valves, right? What are the three potential valves? 
are the three valves you will see in these systems. Come on, folks, what are the three valves? Oil cooler bypass, which is a thermostat. Oil filter, filter bypass, which should never open. And the pressure relief valve, right? Okay, and you understand how all three of those work, the difference between them, because that is very good test question material. All right, folks, I'm gonna stop here for a second and do attendance. Because I should make sure I catch that, because we're going to time out here pretty soon. All right, Evan. Sukran. Uh, Sean. Sean Irani, not here. Oh, there he is. Uh, Travis. Aiden. Christian, KP, Eli, Mark, Josh, Ronan, uh, Harbir, Harbir, no Harbir, just a sec, let me get my notes. Um, Andy, Isaac, um, and Yingyan, and Satnam. Okay, and, and let's move through Mertkan, Jason, Patricia, Braden, Vaughn. Brian, Dan, Aiden, uh, Yato, Vincent, Nat, Sumit, Nathan, Mako, uh, Zihao, and Gideon. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll just keep going through this until we get to the end. Um, I can just do a class vote here. Do you folks want to come back after this? Because we're going to time out here, I think, pretty soon. If nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, we're going to time out here very shortly. Do we want to come back and finish this, or do we want to do it tomorrow? Well, we've got a bit of a lead coming here. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to come back. Uh, we, we didn't vote. All right, I'll do this again. Yes or no? Do we... Uh, I think I did. I didn't mark them absent. Yes, to because we're going to run. We're almost at the four hour mark here. Um, we can come back when because this is going to time out on me shortly. We could take a few minutes um, when I when I get close here and or come right back at it and finish this kahoot today, or we could just you know hit it tomorrow. So yes is come back. Yes is finish it today. We want to finish it today. Oh, now it's shifting a little bit. All right. Well, what I can do, too, is I can just make it optional. Those of you who want to, I'll come back and we'll finish it. Those of you who don't, I won't.
Yeah. Okay. Let's get back to this anyway. So we're, we're going to be pretty close. We might even finish it. How about if you answer them right, and then we'll go really fast? Oil cooler bypass valve. Oil cooler bypass valve. What does it do? It bypasses the oil cooler. And what does that do? Does that prevent uncooled oil from reaching the engine? No. Uncooled oil is allowed to reach the engine. Not really a thing. We regulate the oil temperature. Oil cooler bypass valve regulates the oil temperature. All right, I think we're going to finish this after all my debate there. I shouldn't have wasted the time. Oil pressure relief valve. This is the one in the side of your pump with that little 13 16 that you're supposed to set. Oil pressure gets too high, it will open, obviously. Right, nice. Regulates our oil pressure. If you're at low, if you're at idle and the oil pressure is getting ridiculously low, what's that most likely mean? Come in after a flight, drop to idle. Well, pressure gets really low, most likely. Okay, oil pump motor. How are oil pumps driven? By the engine. There's no such thing as an oil pump motor. Oil pump drive belt. Again, it's a spline drive. There's no drive belt to slip. And if the oil were too cold, would the oil pressure be too low or too high? If the oil were too cold, the oil pressure would be high. Hot oil gives us low pressure. Ah, that light comes on on your old Chevy Colorado or old Chevy pickup truck. And what does that mean? It starts flickering. Most likely, you're almost out of oil. We're going to finish this, folks. Um, yeah, we tend to put uh, oil pressure from both engines on the same gauge, Temp oil temperature from both engines on the same gauge, because it's a much better visual way to look at it. If you put temperature and pressure on one gauge, they never point at each other. Um, so two gauges pointing at each other is a good, quick, easy visual check for the pilots. Oil pressure is your indication of you're almost out of oil. So the oil pump is getting gulps of air when it runs out of oil and you get zero pressure. And then so a little bit of oil dribbles down and it gets a nice shot of oil again and the oil pressure shoots back up to full pressure. So you'll get a, uh, that mostly usually indicates that you're almost out of oil. Oh, this one was a, If that oil dilution valve, 
That's for adding gasoline to the oil. And I'm going to skip past this. I'm going to spend a lot of time. Uh, you'll likely see low oil pressure at the engine start because you're going to have really thin oil. Uh, high fuel consumption, you'd never notice it. High oil consumption, well, these things basically gulp oil all the way, all the time anyway. Oops, skipped over that. This one you should probably know. Um, what was the last question? I skimmed that. Um, I, I, I accidentally clicked it. Um, oh, the question was, uh, um, what was a likely indication of a leaking uh, oil dilution valve? And the correct answer is um, low oil pressure at engine start, because that oil is going to be so thin with all its, you basically got gasoline instead of oil. So you'll end up with low oil pressure. At engine start, remember my little story about the pilot flying into Alberta. And those of you in the chat correctly answered, if the person before you didn't operate the oil dilution system when the engine was warm on your cool down, you can't operate it when the engine's flat cold. It's minus 40. You know, what are you going to dump oil on top of the gasoline? It'll just sit there. It won't mix in. You can't crank it. So at that point, uh, I heard some recommendations to pray, uh, to wait for spring. You could build a bonfire under the engine, try and warm it up. You could hope there's somebody with a hanger nearby, but basically you're stuck. Last question. Nice. Okay. Um, so I think that's a good place to call this a day. Tomorrow, we're going to have a lot of review to do. We have a little bit of new material, but not that much. Um, we've got a lot of review to do because uh, we've got, you know, two weeks worth of material and it's important. Some of you are at that, that scary 68% spot that we really want to help you get past. So go through um, the... Uh, um, review sheets, those, uh, wow, 20 out of 31 and we're at the top score. That's a little depressing for me as an instructor. <laughs>